Good evening, everybody. Our top story is the White House at the epicenter of vicious attacks from the left and the right. The national left-wing media amplifying unfounded, vicious uh, accusations against President Trump. President Trump and the administration fighting back in full force. But frankly, I think most of America would be happy to ignore it. Unfortunately, the individuals in this room continue to create a large platform for somebody they know not to have a lot of credibility, for someone they frankly refuse to give a, a platform to when they worked here at the White House. And we take up the White House strategy to discredit the fake news and focus on the Trump agenda. Kellyanne Conway joins us tonight. Also, another round of primaries with President Trump endorsed candidates on the ballot. Will we see more evidence of a red wave building into the midterms? Republican strategist Ed Rollins joins us with his take on these races and the prospects of a blue or a red wave. Troubling signs of a resurgent Taliban in Afghanistan, a surprise offensive, catching U.S. and Afghan forces off guard. Four-star General Jack Keane joins us tonight. He'll give us his take on the state of the U.S. strategy in Afghanistan. And our top story tonight, the White House under attack from the national left-wing media, as per usual, and the assault shows no sign of letting up. The buzz over the past few days centering on former White House aide Omarosa Manigault. Her new book, in which she smears the president, apparently in the obvious hope of ginning up enough publicity to take the book to the top of the bestseller list. So far, her hopes have been partly realized. The book being published by Gallery Books. That, by the way, is an imprint of Simon & Schuster. And also, it's owned by a company, a CBS Corporation. That's right, the very same CBS that attacks the president on a daily basis through its news operation. The president remains unfazed by all of these ongoing assaults. He's been uh, <laughs> used to them over the course of the past two and a half years. Uh, the White House press secretary throwing the left-wing media's hypocrisy right back in their faces at today's briefing. Joining us tonight, Kellyanne Conway, counselor to the president of the United States, President Trump. Uh, and Kellyanne, great to have you with us and to see you. Uh, let's start with uh, all of the uh, kerfuffle around Omarosa uh, and uh, the pushback from the White House. How, how long is this going to go on? Well, who knows? I think the president's mostly focused on the great job he's doing with the economy, the firing of Peter Strzok, which I believe is the big news of the day, Lou. I agree. We, you know, we now have another guy high up in the FBI has lost his job, Jim Comey, Andrew McCabe. This guy struck. Lisa Page is gone, his uh, one-time lover and, and the receiver of th tens of thousands of text messages on from this government phone of Peter Strzok, who then, then put on his personal email a highly sensitive search warrant. Here's the thing. Uh, so, Diane. You know, we've got, as you, as you cite, James Comey, gone. Uh, Andrew McKay, gone. Peter Strzok, gone. We're finally. talking about the top levels of the FBI uh, rife with political corruption. Uh, I think that the president deserves from the special counsel a reason why they don't close their doors, shut down their operation, and send the 17 angry Democrats uh, crying all the way home but to put this thing to arrest this witch hunt. Well, this president has made very clear, particularly through his social media feed, Lou, that he feels both sides of this should be investigated. In other words, we're still searching around for certain things. 1.2 million documents later, 33 witnesses later, of uh, what, 16, 15 months later since this started. And yet we see at the highest levels of the FBI, which is really a shame for the rank and file 35,000 or so FBI personnel who try to go to work every day and do their jobs. It's really a shame that those at the top, top echelon, most specifically struck who was in charge of the Clinton email server investigation and then had his thumbs on the scales against Donald Trump saying quote we'll take care of it we'll never let him win and what does he do he gets thrown out he immediately goes to Twitter to like and retweet all the negative anti-Trump stuff sets up a GoFundMe page and shows his true colors he's still biased yeah. but by the way the well, cheese stands alone Peter Orr is still there why is he still there yeah well there's there are a lot of Husband questions of one there are far Nelly more or. questions about the people that remain uh, now still in the upper echelons of the FBI. Uh, but we're also, when we talk about Strzok, that, that uh, you know, crowdfunding, 
uh, that he's doing. A lot of people don't realize he's going to be using that money to sue the FBI and to sue David Bowditch, the deputy director of the FBI, who had the guts to override uh, the Office of Professional Responsibility that wanted a suspension. Think of this, a suspension, -day suspension. for a man who yes. set off the special counsel, who made the decision to... Uh, to use the words extreme uh, carelessness rather than gross negligence uh, when referring to Hillary Clinton in the email scandal. This is a man who was at the center, the epicenter, of what has been three years of horrible corruption on the part of the FBI. And that's just what we know about uh, for the last two years of the Obama administration. Don't and the president's point, Lou, is we should keep sure. we should keep on knowing about it. Let's keep digging and investigating. If they want to All investigate right. the other nonsense, See, that's then, the other then let's keep in, let's keep investigating. It has to go both ways. Yep. I am so struck, though, Lou, that even all the king's horses, all the king's men, all the biased people at the top echelon of the FBI who wanted Hillary Clinton couldn't get her elected. It's so remarkable to me. They knew yeah, well, she was weak and let, pathetic let's, let's say thank and diminished you, Lord. from the beginning. Let's say yes. thank you, Lord, over that one. Because with, uh, without uh, uh, this president in the White House, we this nation would be in unthinkable peril. I, I do want to turn, though, to what you were talking about. Investigating, uh, I think that there's no question, I, and the president has raised this on Twitter, uh, and that is there is no question that Hillary Clinton's investigation of her email scandal should be reopened immediately because of what has happened with Strzok and the others uh, in the politically corrupt upper echelons of the FBI. That should happen immediately. But what I also think is important is this special counsel. If he is absolutely insistent upon staying in operation, then he should, as uh, Rod Rosenstein, the deputy attorney general said in creating uh, the, uh, the, the mission memo, the scope memo, he should go where the facts lead him. And the facts right now are leading him uh, to what about the collusion between the DNC, the Hillary Clinton campaign, the Russians, and the relationship between the White House and, and the Department of Justice and the FBI and the CIA under President Obama. I think there are rich, fertile grounds there for Mr. Mueller to investigate, don't you? Uh, Lou, there sure seems to be a true scandal lobber, if you will, on that side, as always blossoming. I want to make a very important point that's often lost. Many of these struck emails and so much of the nefarious activity, including with Christopher Steele and Bruce Orr, seems to go into 2017. So it occurred after their preferred candidate, Hillary Clinton, lost miserably yeah. to President Trump, wasn't a squeaker. It was decisive. They still were at it after he was democratically and duly elected. They were at it with That's a ferocity and a velocity that should concern all Americans. So to your point, that all should be investigated. And I think the, the, the public has a right to know. Accountability. Absolutely transparency has to run every single way but the president had a sixth sense about this for a while now he's been way on top of this hey what about the emails what about the server what about what about these text messages what about the fact that this one's wife is working for the research firm that's in collusion yep. with cahoots with so I think it's important and we're not yet we're not yet satisfied that we know all of those answers well Kellyanne Conway we're out of time but I just do want to uh, leave you with a smile on your face the president at 50 percent uh, in the Rasmussen tracking poll uh, with uh, that uh, approval rating. Uh, the fight goes on, and uh, it's good to see uh, you and the, the, uh, look, entire the economy, Trump White the House security, winning. everything is going well. Thank you. Absolutely, not yet tired of winning. Thank you, Lou. You got it. Thanks, Kellyanne Conway, for all you do. Thank you. Never tired of winning. Well, Paul uh, Paul Manafort's legal team resting. Uh, its case today without calling any witnesses. Closing arguments are scheduled to begin tomorrow morning before the judge hands the case over to jurors for their deliberation. Up next, a resurgent Taliban fighting to gain control of an Afghan town. We take up the deadly offensive. General Jack Keane joins us here next. We'll be right back. Stay with us. 100 Afghan soldiers, at least 20 civilians, killed in a surprise Taliban attack against the city of Ghazni in northern Afghanistan. The surprise attack has now uh, gone on to five days of, uh, of uh, warfare. The city, which is only 75 miles away from the capital of Kabul, is under 
still Afghan government control, but the fighting rages on. Joining us tonight, retired four-star general, Fox Business strategic analyst, General Jack Kane. General, uh, it, is, it is strange to hear the words surprise attack uh, after all of the troops that we have there, all of the forces we have deployed uh, in uh, Afghanistan. Uh, what is going on? Well, f the fact is, is that we have never recovered from the awful decision that President Obama made when Petraeus and McChrystal, two of our best counterinsurgency generals, came forward to him, made a recommendation, put in play a, a counterinsurgency strategy, which he agreed with. Then they told them we need the minimum forces to accomplish that winning strategy is 40,000 troops. He cut it by 25 percent and then said, well, I'm going to pull the troops out in 15 months. We've never recovered from that decision, Lou. That doomed Afghanistan to the path we're on now. Enter President Trump and his national security team. They know they, they don't have a winning hand. So what the president decides to do is buy for time. So he says, I'm not going to arbitrarily withdraw. I'm going to stay the course. I'll strengthen the Afghan National Army as best I can with advisors. And what's not stated, Lou, we're going to try to convince the Taliban that they can't win. And what we'll be able to do is maybe win at the negotiating table and end this thing politically. That's kind of what the strategy is that's unfolded. Problem with that, Taliban's got initiative. They've got freedom of movement. At times they can go out and attack where they want to attack and certainly mm -hmm. undermine the government and undermine political will for that government. And that's what they're doing here. A small outpost did fall to the Taliban. Ghazni is still under government control, Afghan government control. How important is it that Ghazni uh, be preserved under government control and the Taliban defeated uh, in their so-called surprise offensive. Yeah, no, no doubt. We, we've got to take that back from them, and we, and we will take that back. But, I mean, the Taliban have got a, a political and a moral victory here as a result of it, because this is a prominent city, not too far from Kabul, as you mentioned uh, in, the, in the introduction. They've already kind of got what they want out of this. In other words, they've demonstrated that they're still powerful, that they, they want a stake in Afghanistan for the future, and they want to carve that stake out as much as they can militarily, so when they sit down at the negotiating table, they'll get more out of that deal. It's, it is, I, I think, worth considering uh, deeply. Uh, certainly our military and our geopolitical uh, experts in Washington uh, and around the world. Uh, the United States took control of Afghanistan, effective control, in 2002. Uh, through uh, its uh, measures uh, led in some parts by the CIA, uh, paramilitary operations, as well as uh, U.S. special forces uh, throughout the, the country. We have squandered that over the course of uh, time uh, through uh, two administrations, and now we're faced with the prospect, the Taliban, uh, which controlled the country all those years ago, uh, will be back and just as menacing, if not more so, uh, in, in what would be victory, what are we to do? Well, uh, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, what, what happened to us is, is that in late 2001, literally four weeks after the Taliban were defeated by the, the strategy and, and people you just mentioned, the Bush administration made a decision to go to war in Iraq. That was December 2001. Right. Uh, the reason why I know that, I was there. Yep. And, and we have never recovered from that decision. We never put any forces of any consequence back into Afghanistan. Meanwhile, the Taliban reemerged predictably because we didn't have the forces there to stop them from reemerging, and we didn't build an Afghan military because we went off to fight the war in Iraq. It, we never put forces back in there until 2008. President Bush did it at the end of his administration. And then unfolded what I just described in 2009 and 2010. This has always been a secondary effort. I mean, it, it, I mean, it's tragic. 17 years, the United States of America, most powerful military in the world, can't defeat some people kept running around with AK-47, which is an assault rifle, and using homemade explosive devices and fired shoulder-fired grenades. Mm -hmm. This is what these guys are doing. Of course we can.
We've never put the right resources in there, and we've never had the right strategy. And my view is, you know, if you're going to fight a war, you should probably make up your mind to win it and just go out and get that done. We did that in 2002, uh, as, as you and I both noted. Uh, it is, uh, to me, uh, you know, as President Trump has pointed out, uh, you can put the number at $6 trillion, you can put it at $7 trillion. What Iraq has cost us, Afghanistan, uh, and uh, a, a, an adventurous uh, a military campaign uh, that's, that's spread over a decade and a half that has come to this. Uh, we, uh, you know, President Trump has said in his campaign, we've got to have a smart government, and we've got to have a smart military. And right now, we just don't look very smart, do we, General? No. Um, I, the, the, the good decision the president made was to stay the course. But we still don't have the right resources in there, and we're permitting, we're, and you and I have spoken about this before, and this is the elephant in the room, we're permitting the Afghan Taliban to have two sanctuaries in Pakistan. Now, we've pulled military aid away from the Pakistanis, but they can get that back from the Chinese real easy. We have to put real pressure on the Pakistanis in a way that our two previous presidents were not willing to do. And I hope this one steps up and does it, because that will also really start to have some impact on the Taliban, where they can't take refuge, yeah. where all their leaders are, where they do their training, and when they leave the battlefield to refresh themselves, knowing that no one's going to bother them there. That's an absurdity. And no insurgency has ever been defeated when there's sanctuaries outside the combat zone. And we're tolerating it. And we're also tolerating all these years later, all of those poppy fields in Afghanistan uh, that supply all of that opium to the world uh, and uh, create death and devastation across the globe. Why don't we destroy those poppy fields? We can. It, I it know we can. Little- it takes a little bit of will on our part, and we'd, we'd have to get the cooperation of the Afghan government. And right now, we don't have that cooperation to do that. General, it's a war, right? It and, is. And we've got our people in harm's way. I don't know that we need to ask that much permission when we see what is wrong. Uh, but that's, we'll continue that conversation. You've had to live with those choices over all these years and make those decisions. It's always great to have you and your insight with us. Thanks so much, Jim. Yeah, good talking, Lou. Thank you. More than half of the refugee households in this country now are receiving benefits at the expense of American taxpayers, according to a new research uh, paper from the Center for Immigration Studies. From 2011 through 2015, 56% of refugee households were receiving food stamps. 34% of refugee adults receiving Medicaid, refugee medical assistance, 27% 27% of the households receiving wel- welfare of all kinds. Be sure to vote in our poll tonight, and the question is this. After the firings of Peter Strzok, Andrew McCabe, and Director James Comey, is it time for the FBI to end the Mueller witch hunt and reopen the investigation into Clinton corruption? Cast your vote on Twitter at Lou Dobbs. Follow me on Twitter at Lou Dobbs. Like me on Facebook. Follow me on Instagram at Lou Dobbs tonight. Up next here, a former Paul Ryan aide is running to replace him. Now that's nice, isn't it? But there's something he forgot to mention on his campaign website. Now that's very peculiar, this omission. We take it up with Ed Rollins, who has all of the answers to all of the questions political. Right after this break, stay with us. Breaking news now. We're just about a half hour from the poll uh, closing in Vermont. It's one of four primaries being held tonight. The other three states are Connecticut, Minnesota, and Wisconsin. Now, the president has endorsed Scott Walker for Wisconsin governor and Pete Stauber for a House seat in Minnesota's uh, 8th congressional district. So we're going to be checking uh, the president's record on his endorsements. He's doing pretty well. Uh, I will give that much away, and we'll take a look at just how well he's doing. Lame Duck Speaker Paul Ryan, by the way, has made an endorsement of his own, and he has groomed one of his former staffers, Brian Steele, to fill his Wisconsin congressional seat that he has promised to vacate, but it seems like it's taking a long time to get him out of town. 
Uh, it seems Steele, however, no longer wants to admit that uh, previous relationship uh, with Paul Ryan. Curiously, get ready, there is absolutely no mention of Steele having worked for Ryan on his own campaign website. Steele facing former Green Beret Nick Pulse in tonight's first district Republican primary. Uh, this is not a guaranteed deal. He's well ahead. Uh, but if you have to take down the speaker's name, you know, he looks a little like uh, yes. Ryan there, didn't he? Uh, joining us now, Ed Rollins, chairman of the Great America PAC, Hall of Fame political consultant. He served as White House political director under President Ronald Reagan. Great to have you Thank here. You. Thank you. Have you ever seen no. a speaker's former staff member who's been put in position, uh, you know, like I, I guess uh, Paul Ryan thinks it's his to hand off to the to the next generation, who doesn't want to be associated with Ryan? It shows me some wisdom on the part of the candidate. Yeah, he's, uh, <laughs> uh, and obviously that his polls must be showing him something that Ryan is not quite the asset he might have been two years ago or four years ago, which we uh, we know that. So uh, this is an interesting day today. This is uh, uh, Wisconsin obviously has a, has a great governor who's running for his third term, uh, Scott Walker, who sort of started this whole thing. Uh, Walker was hurt a little bit, though, by... By running for president. Uh, one of the things that happens when you run for president and you don't do well, it makes it a little tougher when you go back home. And there's two tonight. Plenty, who's, who's running again in Minnesota, is also was damaged when he, uh, he was a front runner a couple of years ago and got blown out early on. Is he uh, going to win? I don't know. I think so. But, uh, it's, it's, he's certainly not a front runner and he's certainly not, uh, not, uh, it's not, not a slam dunk for him. And he was a two term governor too. So. Yeah, Walker's an interesting case because he's been a highly effective, highly successful governor. Tremendous. He is not not a charismatic figure. Right. Uh, he has been vilified by the left. But I think the people of Wisconsin understand that he's kept his word. He's uh, uh, in much the same way that the president has dominated national politics. Walker has made some considerable impression by just keeping his promises in the state of Wisconsin. With, with, Wisconsin was a very liberal state, and basically he was the first he one. Ever. And he and he, he broke through. Uh, he took on the unions, uh, and I thought was a, I think has been a very effective governor, uh, and should be elected real easily. But he's, but it's going to be it's going to be a real battle. It's going to be a real battle. Um, the approval rating. The president has uh, moved uh, back to fifty percent. He's been hovering right at fifty percent uh, for some time now. But a 50% approval rating in the latest Rasmussen tracking poll, he is, I mean, this, I, I mean, I marvel that this president, as much as he is attacked savagely every day from within his own party, from, you know, corporate America, Wall Street, uh, and of course the national left wing media, which is unrelenting, uh, and, and as unrelenting as it is illogical uh, and, and devoid of fact. It, it's it's remarkable that he can do this. Well, he's not lost any of his support among Republicans uh, and, and independents. They've, they've looked at him hard and fast. Uh, he's been, as you say, under siege from the beginning. And I think day by day he gets stronger and day by day he basically, uh, we're now at a point where we're not leading from behind as a nation, we're leading from the front. And he's certainly leading the country on the economic front, on the military front and everything else. No strategic patience. No here. strategic patience. Let, let's talk about the stock fire very quickly. Struck, you know, sort of rounds out the top of the FBI now gone to firings. Uh, it seems to me that this is clearly in the minds of even the most uh, acrimonious, nasty uh, leftists. They'd have to say there's something rotten in the FBI and the Department of Justice, and that should, in my opinion, disqualify the entire special counsel initiative uh, that's, you know, been weighing down this, uh, this country. Uh, for for more than a year, it's dominated it's dominated the media. There's not been one charge put forth that basically is a valid charge, in spite of these guys making stuff up and doing everything they could to sabotage this president. So, these so I guys totally, being FBI guys, high level FBI guys, high level <laughs> counter espionage guys, guys, the guys who make stuff up for spies, not for presidents, or at least. They used to do it that way. Now it's about president. Well, Strzok and his girlfriend gave, 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 Hillary, gave Hillary a total pass, which was a great uh, misjudge of, 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 of uh, miscarriage of judges. Act. Absolutely. And then have done everything they could to basically try and do the president since the day he was elected. Do you so, think that we should reopen? The uh, the Hillary uh, uh, scandal I, I, I investigation. Think, I think we ought to finish this one up first, real quick, and then then then. Well, go I mean, right after we close the doors on the witch hunt. Absolutely, I agree totally. All right, Ed Rollins, I agree with you totally. All right, good, thank As you. As always, pleasure to be with you. Good to see you, and I sure hope you're right in the uh, in the uh, in your assessment of the uh, 
the victors in tonight's uh, primaries in four states. A new poll shows Americans growing weary of Special Counsel Mueller and his 17 angry Dems. According to CNN, of all places, 66% of those surveyed say Mueller should wrap up his investigation before the November midterm elections. Up next, judicial lunacy and all sorts of lunacy in the state of New Mexico. We'll tell you about an outrageous judge's decision for five alleged Muslim terrorists. Right after this break, we'll be right back with the sordid sorry story. Stay with me. A judge in New Mexico releasing five suspected Muslim terrorists who are accused of training children to become terrorists on just $20,000 bail. Judge Sarah Backus, she's a former public defender. You see her there. She ordered the defendants to wear ankle monitors, to not drink, nor should they have guns, and to maintain weekly contact with their attorneys. What in the world is going on in New Mexico? Former FBI Special Agent Chris Swecker defended the decision to fire Peter Strzok today on FoxNews.com, writing in his op-ed, all three of these rogue FBI officials, Strzok, Comey, and McCabe, put themselves on pedestals and cast themselves as noble heroes, willing to sacrifice their own careers for the cause of truth and justice. That's great PR spin, and much of the media has fallen for it. But it's simply not true. We recommend you read the rest of his op-ed. It is excellent, and it is on foxnews.com. Joining us tonight, Harmeet Dillon. She's RNC committee woman for the great state of California. Harmeet, great to have you with us. Uh, let's, uh, Thanks, Lou. Let's start with that judge releasing five suspected terrorists uh, with, with minor bail who had obviously endangered 11 children, were training, or alleged to have trained them to become uh, terrorists. It's just, it's mind-boggling. Yeah, Lou, this is an outrage, and it's bigger than what you just said. Um, so of the five terrorists or suspected terrorists who abused a child or allegedly abused a child, and there's a dead child here, so this is a very serious matter, four of them are being released today, and not even with money bail, but a $25,000 uh, bond, meaning a signature bond. So they only have to sign their own name, and, and if they don't show up, at their hearings, then they have to pay $20,000. You can imagine how that works. The person's right. already on the lam, and now the government's going to go get the money from them. It's ridiculous. And this is as a result of a uh, bail reform uh, legislation in uh, New Mexico two years ago, which Governor Martinez is now trying to repeal because it has resulted in criminals committing crimes while they're out on this uh, lick and a promise signature deal instead of on the public safety where they should be locked up, like in this case. And so, you know, this is a huge issue. Anybody in America, a normal person is going to look at this and say, these people are serious threats to the public right now. Not theoretical. They're accused of killing a child, yeah. of training terrorists, and of abusing children. So this is despicable. This is a former public defender from San Francisco. So again, on the great state of California, I apologize for our exportation of people like this who are affecting criminal justice in other states. It's a really bad situation, Lou. It, it is horrible. And, uh, and at a time when it's clear what the circumstances are in this particular event, in this set of circumstances, uh, why the judge would make this decision and, uh, it, and, and personally uh, threaten public safety in that state. Uh, let's turn to the, Manaf the, the Manafort uh, decision not to, uh, well, to put forward a defense of Paul Manafort uh, after the prosecution rested. What does that, what does that mean uh, in, in your judgment? So, Lou, this is very common in a white-collar crime case. Um, in fact, uh, you know, what the position of the defense is is that the government hasn't proven its case, so there's no need for them to put on a defense. And outside the presence of the jury, the judge actually asked Mr. Manafort himself personally whether he agreed to not testify and put on a defense, and he did say that to the judge outside the presence of the jury. So this is very much expected, and you, we can look forward to some very strong uh, closing arguments by both sides tomorrow in court and then it's waiting time to see what the jury thinks. Is it a suggestion in, uh, to you uh, at least 
uh, that Manafort's attorneys uh, feel pretty strongly that uh, the prosecution hasn't made adequately their case? Yes, I mean, you know, the, the liberty of their uh, client who's uh, in his 70s and, you know, could spend the rest of his life in prison is at risk. So clearly these lawyers who are top-notch lawyers have, um, have believed that they've done a sufficient job of undermining the prosecution's witnesses. I mean, Rick Gates, obviously, a f philanderer, serial philanderer and crook, um, was the star witness for the government. And so uh, they may be betting that the government's overreach here with this case is sufficient for the jury to look at this and say th the case is not proven beyond a reasonable doubt. And the judge has put his thumb on the scale a little bit as well, or at least appears to be very hostile to some of the tactics taken by the prosecution. And I think the defense is very much counting on the jury to have absorbed that and, and take what the prosecution's case is and their lying witness with a grain of salt. Very quickly, Antifa. Uh, threatening the life of the president, uh, threatening him physical harm. Uh, Antifa, that we have heard from the Secret Service, that they are aware of the threats, but then nothing beyond that, the FBI not even acknowledging that. Uh, and, and, and you're bringing, you've brought the lawsuit against the police department of San Jose for channeling a crowd uh, in, into, uh, of, of Trump supporters uh, into harm's way, if you will. Uh, in absolute complicity with uh, Antifa and other groups as well who are represented in that melee. Uh, your thoughts about, first, my first question is why in the world can't the Secret Service say, yes, we're investigating them, uh, and at least as part of a, a effort to prevent uh, further threats or, or harm to the president? Well, the FBI and Secret Service, they're all under the DOJ, and as I previously said on this show, and otherwise, uh, the DOJ is MIA. They have a civil rights division that should be opening up an investigation into the racketeering and organized crime that's going on here. That's what it is. It's organized crime and organized rioting, and it's going on with impunity. So the toxic combination here is these uh, paid leftists. No doubt about it. They, you know, the liberals advertise right. for protesters. They pay them, and then we have, pol and then they pick and choose where these events take place, and they take place in liberal jurisdictions that are complicit, ask the police to stand down. The feds do nothing. It is outrageous that these people are not being infiltrated and then brought up on RICO, criminal RICO, as well as, you know, mayhem and violence charges. Uh, this, is, this is a spreading disease in America. We're seeing this happen in multiple cities. We're seeing Americans get hurt. And the real long-lasting damage is that Americans are afraid to assemble and express their rights peacefully because of these violent criminals. And this is exactly the purpose. And, and they're succeeding, unfortunately. Harmeet, uh, thank you very much as always. We appreciate it. Harmeet Dillon. My pleasure. Up next, predator priests in the Catholic Church. Our panel weighs in a new, uh, on a new disturbing report detailing systematic abuse of children in the state of Pennsylvania. We're coming right back with that and much, much more. Stay with us. A just released uh, grand jury report reveals more than 300 Catholic, Catholic clergy in six Pennsylvania dioceses have been accused of sexually abusing children or covering it up. State Attorney General Josh Shapiro says more than a thousand child victims have been identified and the grand jury believes there are more. Priests were rape, raping little boys and girls. And the men of God who were responsible for them not only did nothing, they hid it all for decades. Though some of the accused clergy have died and the statute of limitations prevents some others from being prosecuted, a priest in the Greensburg, Pennsylvania diocese pleaded guilty last month to molesting a 10-year-old boy. Joining us tonight, Tammy Bruce, Washington Times columnist, Fox Business contributor, WOR radio personality, Mark Simone, great to have you both here. Your reactions, I, you know, I'm one of those people who thought the Catholic Church had taken steps to diminish uh, this ugliness from, uh, from, uh, from their presence. Yeah, I'm a person of faith. Um, I have issues with organized religion because mankind tends to get its hands on things and, and uh, it does horrible things with it. Uh, and yet this is also from decades ago, as you've noted. It's also the broadest uh, 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 investigation a government entity has done in this kind of an instance. The stories are horrific. Uh, they clearly destroy lives. Uh, and uh, uh, the Catholic Church uh, clearly still has uh, uh, some answering to do. Uh, and I don't know, again, I'm, 
I think partly in growing up and hearing these stories is what's affected my view of organized religion. Uh, and that's, uh, that's unfortunate because I think organized religion uh, can do a great deal of good. Um, but uh, it's, it's horrific, and as a community and as a nation... And I think we should say, in we, all fairness, organized religion does great good. Oh, as uh, I've just and, said, and, it and does. And I don't see how uh, what is being reported about the Catholic Church would affect other churches, other denominations, and other faiths. Well, I think that and this is a, certainly for the United States um, and for, for those of us who are people of faith, I think that stories overall of large organized efforts... Uh, and the problems that can stem from them, including our government, um, uh, it, it affects us. And dealing with this head on, like in this case, uh, uh, it makes a difference in, in the ability to trust and to get uh, certainly justice also for the victims. We need to deal with statutes of limitations, frankly, in cases like this. This is how we can work uh, to clear this up, and the church can help us do that. Yeah. It's an ugly thing. I don't want to even go into the details, but there's rapes. There's horrible things Horrific. in this case. There's a letter from somebody in charge saying, "I sorry for what you went through and all." Then we find out it's to the priest. It's to the mm. guilty priest. So this has got to stop. We have a problem in this country. We don't crack down on anything anymore. Like you were talking about Antifa and not cracking down mm -hmm. on this. That's how you end up with somebody like a James Comey. He doesn't crack down on what's going on Great point. At, at the FBI. We've got to stop this. Look at look at Strzok running around raising money for a legal fund. And the first reflex within, within the FBI and its Office of uh, Professional Responsibility was to say it's a suspension uh, and everything will be fine, despite the fact this man was at the, at the center of the special counsel uh, and inception. Uh, he was at the very center and leading, in fact, the Hillary Clinton corruption uh, mm -hmm. investigation and, and the president's... Uh, uh, special counsel, thank you very much, Mr. Strzok. My God, what a, you know, this man is evil incarnate. And it reflects, my second book was called The Death of Right and Wrong, looking at this kind of dynamic proceeding through the nation. We're now seeing the results where there are, is no accountability, where, where there's, you, there's nothing that's going to happen to you, if you, whatever it is that you do wrong. And when it comes from the top of entities that we as Americans rely on, whether it is the Catholic Church or the American government, we love these entities. We've got to fix them, and we're, we're the generation now to do it. I don't it. love these entities at all. Well, I, I am we, very suspicious of a church that cannot, uh, uh, does not solve these kinds of sordid and horrible uh, crimes against their own, uh, f their own flock, their own children. I, I mean, I don't have any patience whatsoever for political corruption. No matter the institution, the agency, or the department. But it's the corruption of everything, every institution. You know, people talk about their kids, the standards aren't the same, behavior isn't the same. You're seeing this everywhere. Look at Mueller with all his conflicts of interest, Rosenstein, all of this. There's no standards anywhere anymore. But we've got to take responsibility in what we do put up with and what we do demand in, in the midst of this. The, one of the things that we should do, it seems to me, Tammy, is not make our problems larger in the abstract. But focus on that which is in front of us. And what is in front of us is some of the ugliest, nastiest uh, human conduct imaginable. And we've got to and display it by putting these people in jail also. I don't care what government position they're in, if they've been a priest, whatever it is, there has to be a demonstration now that's of our Tammy rejection. Bruce we wanted to hear from. You can love them and, and put them in jail, too, to make a point. Uh, I, I, hate to, word here I hate to say it. When I go to confession, I just say to the priest, you first. It's just... <laughs> Well, <laughs> dude, <laughs> Mark Simone never disappoints, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. Mark, thank you very much. We appreciate it. And uh, I, I'd say that that is a wise and, uh, mm. and serious offering in humorous form. <laughs> Mark, thanks so much. Tammy, thank you. Sure. Appreciate it. Up next, the California Republican National Committee chair talks about how to fight back against the radical left wing terrorist group Antifa. Or is it Antifa? Or is it something else altogether? We'll be right back. On Wall Street today, stocks closing higher. The Dow Jones Industrial is up 112 points. The S&P up 18. The Nasdaq gaining 51. The Dow breaking a four-session losing streak. Volume on the big board today, 2.9 billion shares. And a reminder to listen to my reports three times a day, coast to coast on the Salem Radio Network. Well, this is where we are today and uh, what we're looking at for tomorrow. 
Antifa protest death threats still being ignored by the national left-wing media. Attorney and RNC committee woman Harmeet Dillon joining us tonight to discuss the outrage. This is this is a spreading disease in America. We're seeing this happen in multiple cities. We're seeing Americans get hurt. And the real long-lasting damage is that Americans are afraid to assemble and express their rights peacefully because of these violent criminals. And tomorrow, closing arguments in the trial of Paul Manafort taking place at, uh, tomorrow morning at 9.30 in Alexandria, Virginia. And tomorrow, we'll also be discussing the Trump effect in the latest round of primaries, which are taking place today in four states. And, uh, and political strategist Ed Rollins with us, telling us Wisconsin Governor Scott Walker, endorsed by President Trump, he believes will be elected uh, in what he also calls a real battle, uh, saying that both of the president's endorsements will prevail. And with all of the Democratic hysteria about Russia hacking the election, I was just wondering, why aren't the Dems demanding voter identification as a means to protect the integrity of the vote? It would be a very good bipartisan issue. Republicans, Democrats, independents coming together. A, a swoon moment for the national left-wing media. That's it for us tonight. Thanks for being with us. Tomorrow we'll be talking with Joe DeGeneva, Victoria Tensing, and John Solomon. We hope you'll be with us. Thanks for being with us tonight. And good night from New York.